I think it's waking up. You and the other encyclopedists, you've been preparing for some distant crisis. But I think it's here. Now. Hey guys, Pete here. This is my breakdown of Foundation Season 1, Episode 3, The Mathematician's Ghost. I'll be recapping what happened, and then I'll give you my thoughts about the episode and the direction of the series. Of course, this will contain spoilers if you're not caught up. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Episode 2 ended on a big turn, with Rach killing Harry Seldon and sending Gale into space on an escape pod. A little later in this episode, we get a confirmation from Hugo that people do go into hibernation or cryosleep, and I assume that's there to let us know what happened to Gale. Episode 3 opened with another turn, in that it opted not to provide the resolution or aftermath of the event on the ship, and instead decided to jump around on the timeline. The episode opens with another voiceover narration from Gale talking about ghosts. The Empire's, and more specifically the Palace of the Empire's ghost is Cleon I. We go back in time 400 years to the end of his reign and see him planning with Demerzel for what comes after his death. This makes her role more explicit. You see that she was there to plan it, that she was involved in setting up the clone program and the transition, and that kind of implies that she was actually running the Empire for a period of time, since she says that the first brother Don they put on the throne was still a baby. There's an emphasis on loyalty here, her loyalty to the Empire, to Cleon's dynasty, and the question of if the Empire will be loyal to her. So far, we're only working with vague references to what's going on with robots in the TV show, which means all of this is still a mystery. From there, we jump to 19 years after the Starbridge bombing. It's the strange time in the cycle where Lee Pace is playing Brother Dawn. That doesn't last for long though because it's Brother Dusk's last day before becoming Brother Darkness or the end of his life which they refer to as his ascension. This is the version of Dusk who was in favor of mercy for Anacreon and Thespis and he's still thinking about that and what Harry Seldon said now that he's reaching the end. As a final present, they all go up to destroy what's left of the Star Bridge in orbit. As they're looking at it for the last time, Dawn and Day promise to make something better in Cleon's honor for the outgoing Dusk. We see that the work was ongoing when the original Cleon died. It then became a very visible reminder of his legacy on Trantor, and then of course it fell during the attack. Demerzel has been there from its beginning to its end, and she almost looks emotional here, and Dusk asks her about it later, in this odd exchange where he questions her love for him and her feelings for the original Cleon. She tells him that he's enough, but after he closes his eyes, she continues saying, it's just that you always leave me. In the morning, he goes to his ascension. Brother Dawn becomes the new Brother Day, having grown into their greatness. The new Dawn is presented as the old Dusk is ready to incinerate himself, and something about that situation starts to feel wrong to him. There may be something to this because he's experienced this same ceremony in the past, but before we find out, Demerzel grabs his arm, starts to sing to him, and then encourages him on his way to meet his end. From there, the story jumps forward another 17 years, where we meet the 14th edition of Cleon, who was the baby that was crying at the ceremony as he's becoming a young man. After that, we transition to see the colonists arrive on Terminus. Because everything about their landing is planned out, they're surprised to find the vault when they get there. As they approach it, they experience the null field and everyone gets knocked out. They scuttle the slow ship, they crash it on the surface, and then they build up the colony. There's a brief scene of Salver when she's younger. Her parents are talking about her being a dreamer or a thinker, and she seems to be fascinated by the vault. We fast forward to where she's grown and watch her do an experiment where she discovers that the null field is expanding. It's getting bigger. In her role as the warden, we see that she's working on this fence, this sort of generated field that protects their colony. And we also see the encyclopedists working to preserve knowledge to follow through on Harry's plan. Solver takes her mother to the vault to show her that the null field is growing, and they talk about her connection to it, how her mother found her underneath it as a child. At the time, her parents kept this a secret because they didn't want her to be treated differently. We learn that Salver was drawn to it, she thought it was calling to her, and then when she was underneath it, she couldn't understand why it was hurting her mother. 
When asked if she can hear it now, if it's calling her, she just says that she thinks it's waking up. So even though they kept it a secret, it's mentioned that she's still an outsider and we see that she doesn't really mix with the other colonists. And to that, her mom reminds her that she's always been special. Her boyfriend Hugo, who's a traitor, arrives. He's got a 29-hour stop on the planet. We see some of their romance, some of their life, how that works. And after they have sex, she has a feeling which gets her out of bed and she leaves to check the perimeter. She ends up seeing, or more likely imagining, a child running into the old ship. She's never able to catch up with it and to get a good look, but as viewers, we can see that he has what looks like Rach's knife in his hand. He disappears after she follows him inside, and she just finds one of those bishop claw creatures that are native to the planet there. And when she scares it away, she notices something in the sky above the planet. Her and Hugo check it out through her telescope, and they realize that Anacreon ships have shown up. This is the first time anyone's come to the planet in 30 years. She takes this information to the encyclopedists, who don't really think it's a big deal. As far as they're concerned, they're a part of the Empire, they're protected by the Emperor, and all they need to do is just call them, let them know what's happening, and they'll intervene because, of course, this is Anacreon. When they attempt to make contact, they realize that the comms buoy isn't working. They look for rational reasons that this might be happening, things unrelated to what's going on with the ships above their planet, but Salvor is not convinced. She starts taking stock of the weapons and preparing for the worst, thinking that they just went by the buoy so they probably destroyed it on their way. And we see the division here, she's considered an outlier, they actually call her that and basically dismiss anything that she says. They realize they have about 40 hours until they arrive. In an act of desperation, Salver's mom pulls out the Prime Radiant, which she collected from Harry's room after he was killed, just to see if maybe Salver will connect with it. Salver had never seen it, doesn't know anything about it, and her mom asks her to take a look at it because if she was part of the plan, it would make it a lot easier to believe in it. She seems fascinated, but there doesn't seem to be anything that she can do. You see the equations swirl around and then sort of fall, but it's not clear if she had any effect on that at all. And before they leave, she makes the distinction that different is not the same as special. As they're waiting for the ships to get there, she has another feeling. She ends up chasing the vision of the young Rach again, but this time she finds the creature and notices it's been shot by an arrow. She finds herself surrounded with what looks like a group of warriors, saying that Anacreons are not allowed on Imperial soil. What are you doing here? And the episode ends there. To wrap it up, we got a pretty interesting look into the genetic dynasty, and I think that was the strongest part of the episode. We're left with the impression that after Harry's death, after the exile of the encyclopedists, things carry on with the Empire, and the clones continue to be a nice addition. I thought the transition from the end of the second episode into this one was a little jarring. There was a good build-up for that somewhat shocking conclusion, and then it felt like we were picking up with a completely different show in the third episode. I think some of the sequences here work well on their own, but the whole was a little disorienting, and nothing was actually wrapped up by the end. I said in my last video that I try to look at the show on its own merits rather than comparing it to the source material, and I think as an episode of TV that this one didn't work nearly as well as the first two. The high point continues to be the production, the way things look. The scuttling of the ship was impressive. It was nice to see the statue of Harry on Terminus. The colony is believable as far as that goes. It seems pretty clear that they're trying to have Terminus present the polar opposite of Trantor. And I think most of that works. On the Cleon side of things, it's setting up mysteries about Demerzel's loyalty and overall role while fleshing out the mechanics of how the genetic dynasty operates. It's notable that the one member who was concerned with Harry Seldon passed on in this episode. That could be an indication that they're no longer concerned with the Foundation 19 years after his death, and likely less so in the timeline 17 years after that. Is there something going on with the new brother Don? I mean, I'm not sure why you include that bit there at the ceremony if there isn't, but it kind of came out of nowhere, so it's not clear where it's headed. 
the idea of Demerzel being in love with Cleon, that's a bit hard to parse given that she's a robot. Seeing her look emotional is one thing, but I wonder if there's not some angle where the Cleons are interpreting her devotion as love because they're human and they see it through that lens. As I said, the whole concept of robots in the TV show is just mysterious, and I hope as they move forward they continue to fill in the blanks. On the Terminus side, they're establishing themselves, getting things going, and now they're up against the threat from their angry neighbors. Anacreon should still be feeling the effects of the attacks on their planet, and so I guess maybe that's why they're there? It went back and forth some, trying to develop Salvor's character while showing what the Foundationers or the Encyclopedists were up to, and I don't think it really pulled off either thing, but part of that might be related to the fact that they ended on another cliffhanger. There's some light references to Harry and what happened. Salver's mom had the Prime Radiant. Rach was not amongst the people who landed on Terminus and doesn't seem to be around, doesn't seem to have ever been around. But overall, the ending of Episode 2 is still a mystery as well. As far as the adaptation goes, I liked seeing Louis Perrine. I liked that the divides there between the Encyclopedists and Salvor, although it has a way different feeling based on how she's being introduced. I think they could have done a better job building up the Encyclopedists, but hopefully that'll continue into the next episode. Some ripple effects are starting to show up now from the changes they made. The emphasis on Salver being special certainly echoes what they were setting up with Gale. Makes it seem more likely that there's a reason she's seeing visions of a young Rach running around with a knife. I suppose a lot of what they're doing now will depend on the payoffs that follow down the road. As a book reader, I miss the old version of Salvor Hardin, and am hoping to be pleasantly surprised in what happens to this changed version, and I think I'll leave it there. Let me know what you think in the comments. For the non-readers, how did you think this held up in comparison to the first two episodes? Do you think they lost all the momentum they built up with Harry's death? And book readers, let me know what's on your mind, just remember to mark your spoilers. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching, I'll talk to you soon.